the point here is that I think that the USDA Dietary Guidance Committee and the, the final result at the end of this year will be the worst ever in the history of the food pyramid. I think that there's going to be very little meat. There's going to be a lot of meat replacements. And I just think it's going to be another disaster. They'll say that beef in excess will kill you, whereas the vegans will say beef will kill you. You know, so they're looking at the same studies and interpreting them differently. My favorite part when I gave my talk, I was talking about the mental illness present in the vegan community. And people are sort of laughing and they're like flapping like this, like, I'm bringing this up because in 2017, when they found me on YouTube, they started to attack me. I had to block two to three per week for a year. I blocked over 300 vegans off my channel. But I also show them the research and how they're reversing severe mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar, major depression on a ketogenic diet. All right, welcome. We've got uh, with us uh, someone I hadn't talked to in a number of years, uh, Dr. Darren Schmidt. Uh, he's out on uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. He's going to talk to us about, I guess, a number. you got a whole list, so a number of topics. And Darren, before we delve into that, since some people may not remember <laughs> the last time I talked to you or different people, quick quick background, and then we'll get we'll get into it. Okay. So I'm a chiropractor. I've been in practice since 1997. I've been studying nutrition since 1993. And my whole uh, sort of tagline is new and old clinical discovery solving complex chronic illness with only diet supplements and i was uh, low carb beginning in 1999 and then i learned about the ketogenic diet in 2015 started ketosis cycling in and out of ketosis and then i saw you on joe rogan so i started the carnivore diet august of 2018 so my version of the carnivore diet is um 90, 90 to 95 percent of my calories come from meat and so, yeah, low carb now all these years. And so, so I yeah, have that's, that's, that's over 20, that's 25 years. That's an unsustainable diet, I'm told, right? <laughs> it's when I, and when I was like from 99 to 2015, I was very strict in that every day my carb count was less than 75 grams a day. And if I were to cheat, I would still be below 125 grams of carbs a day. So, but once I started eating the ketosis, I go, you know, deep in ketosis and they come out, right? So high carb to, to come out, cycling in and out. There's, that's my history. So I have this practice in Ann Arbor. Um, there's five of us practicing nutrition. Um, we've seen 60,000 nutrition visits in the last five years. I think it's the largest nutrition clinic in the country where we don't take insurance. So that makes us, we, like, we have to get people better. If we don't get people better, why would anybody come and, and pay for our services? So I haven't taken insurance now since November of 2005. So you said you studied nutrition since I think you said 96 or so or something like that. So were you, did you have like a, so did you had a nutri, did you have nutrition training prior to going to become a chiropractic or how did that work? No, I just started studying it on my own Got when it. I was okay. an undergrad. And then I uh, got some nutrition classes at chiropractic school and just really took off from there. Yeah. Cause some people say, I look at the food I'm eating and therefore I'm studying nutrition nutrition. So but you've had a serious, you know, obviously intellectual relationship or interest in that. So okay, so so you've been doing this, you know, it's either, you know, put up or shut up type of thing. You know, you don't get paid if you don't produce results, which is, you know, really how medicine should be. I mean, you think about how uh, you know, the insurance companies we fund this miasma mess of People just this money changing hands and people not really getting better. I mean, it's just it's just a lot of insurance companies paying for it. I didn't get really good results. I didn't have that much skin in the game. But when you got to pay for it, you expect results, and and that's what you uh, are required to deliver to stay in business. And you're still in business, so you must be getting some results, right? So exactly. Yeah. All right, you got a list. Let's start on that list. What do you want to chat about today? So let's start off with the USDA Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, and that's mm -hmm. what we talked about five years ago when I was on TV, <clears throat> and so. I've spoken back five years ago. I flew to DC and then I flew to Houston and I spoke to the committee twice. And my message was pretty much the same, like get to look at the science and observational studies are not science. And, and then this time, this time around, they have a video opportunity. So I did like a three minute video, submitted that same message. And then I, they have an open portal. So you can submit comments and questions, I mean, comments primarily. And I've submitted like six comments so far. And they say that they're reading the comments, but they're obviously they're not at all. They're not at all. And the point here is that um, I think that one of the leaders of this 20 member committee is Dr. Christopher Garner. Do you know that name? 
Three days in Stanford. Yeah, I know Chris. I, well, I don't know yeah. Chris. In fact, I was theoretically supposed to have a debate with that guy in California, but I don't know if it's going to materialize. But yeah, so I know Chris. He's a he's a twins Netflix guy. You know, yeah, that he's a vegan. Guy. He's a vegan since 1983. Right. He admits this on his podcast. He says he's not biased in any way regarding diet, but he's obviously biased. And his uh, clinic at Stanford is funded by Beyond Burger and Impossible Burger. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm watching these videos. But the, this committee has several um, meetings, and they record it, and they post it. And I think I kind of think he's one of the opinion leaders of this group because he's actually like a nice guy to talk to. He's pretty dynamic. And, um, but they're activists and I can see that they're like cheering each other on to replace meat with other products. Right. And it's very disappointing. And then I start, I actually found Gardner's email because he's, Stan he's at Stanford. So all these email addresses are available because it's a public job. And I emailed them and they said, look, you gotta look at the science, just ignore the surveys. And we went back and forth twice. And this, when I emailed them back, they said, John Ioannidis, also at Stanford, Right, he's a mathematician, not a researcher. You know, he says that when you look at observational um, studies in nutrition, the chance of finding truth is one to ten to one to a thousand. Whereas when you do a clinical trial, randomized clinical trial, your chance of finding truth is one to one versus or one to two, or I'm sorry, two to one. But it's it's even greater than one to one. It's two to one. And I gave him these numbers, and Darden's response back to me was, "I don't like John Ioannidis." Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, so you don't like math, you don't like truth, you don't like science, that like you're obviously like a science denier. There's so many people, and I've been watching a lot of vegans, there's Simon Hill, there's um, all these, you know, of course, Dr. Greger, right? It's all about these observational studies, but when you eliminate that, because they're basically surveys, you end up at, you know, real science. So the point here is that I think that the USDA Dietary Guidance Committee and the, the final result, as you know, this year will be the worst ever in, you know, the history of the food pyramid. I think that there's going to be, you know, very little meat. There's going to be a lot of meat replacements. And I just think it's going to be another disaster. Yeah, no, I, know, I know the 2020 guidelines, they were trying to move that saturated fat max cap from 10% down to 7. They, they, un, they were unsuccessful in that. Maybe this year they will... You know, maybe they'll give that to where you're eating even less animal products, you know, because of the clear right. saturated fat content, right? Yeah. So five years ago, they had 43 questions that they created for this committee. And so in the summer, I sat down with these 43 questions and I answered them. It took me about a half hour. And the way that I answered them was using a protein leverage hypothesis. So when you eat more protein, the need for fat and carbs goes down. You end up eating less calories. You know, simple, right? It makes total sense. Now, these 43 questions were broken up into different subcommittees. And then they just came up with their answers about two months ago. They recorded this whole meeting. And they didn't have good answers at all. And some of these questions are so ridiculous that it's impossible to answer them. So the point is, it's a total mess. They don't even know how to ask the right questions. So, I mean, the you know, they're saying that they are going to they're going to, they're going to accept input from from people outside the committee, but it's more is it more just theater basically to say put on the show it's and, totally it's, and, 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 yeah. the, and the and the outcomes are already predetermined based upon maybe whoever's funding this and the USDA is funded by in large part by commodity agriculture and commodity as a commodity they want these commodities you know sold and so I mean you know you think about it it's really a conflict of interest to have the USDA. Uh, which represents commodities, right. prescribing our, our, our prescribing our, our our dietary policy, uh, right? What, and you know, and, and you know, as you know, you know, Ty Coles and others have been doing this for years, trying to put the science in front of these committees. And they seem to, I I just almost say, well, you seem like you're just beating your head against a wall. You are. You're yeah. not getting anywhere. So is it is it pointless? I, mean, I don't know. I mean, right. So and yeah, at the the first meeting, so January of last year, at the end of that meeting. They had this round table and they said, okay, go through one, one by one. Tell us what you're excited about. Tell us what you're looking forward to in the next few years while we come up with these, you know, with our solutions. And there's 20 people and four of them said, we want to make sure we're looking at science. And Gardner was one of those people of those four. The other 16 people wanted to talk about and were excited to learn about equity. 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 Yeah. There's no science. Is there a science there? I don't know about that. 
I said, I said, oh, we need to look at the best science so that we can help people in the best, in the best way. So, yeah. So, um, the other thing I want to say is that, um, they are like, I said that they're activists they're like high fiving each other. Yeah. I already said that. And, um, I don't know. I think that's it. That's all I have to say about that one. <laughs> about the use of your dietary guidelines. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I think I saw a recent of the, of the members, 95% of them all have ties to, you know, very, very financial ties to the food industry and really all these processed food companies. And yeah. Things. And that's how they so, control our diet, our free supply. It's like these corporations are getting in these people who basically they really don't know much at all, to be honest. And I think one of the 20 is a clinician. Everybody else is a professor researcher i think only one is a clinician yeah. yeah yeah well i mean you know the other the other the, 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 always a caveat they will say is this is a diet designed for quote unquote healthy people and yet we have arguably 85 percent of the population is unhealthy and so it's kind of like well man, right. that's yeah, yeah. I, I don't i don't i don't hold out much hope for the dietary guidelines that are ever being decent <laughs> they're stupid no um, and i you know I, I look at like a company you know I, i've always i pointed out like brazil's dietary guidelines eat don't eat processed food you know or avoid processed food cook at home eat with people you love you know and, and that's probably as good of a that, that's probably as good advice as you can get with the parent to like trying to say you need to eat no more than you know 15 percent whatever added sugar and 10 percent right. saturated fat and Blah 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 stuff, and it's it's I don't know. It's, I think it's a cute situation. The problem is it's it's reflected in the schools, it's reflected in the military, it's reflected in any any federal agencies, reflected in uh, what uh, you know uh, underserved populations have on you know you know with food stamps and whatnot. So so it it matters, but it's you know I mean most people ignore the dietary guidelines. I certainly do. Yeah. So that leads us into the next subject. I want to head on is the about seed oil, so we all know, well, let me, I've just watched so many videos because in the last, um, about three, about three weeks ago, I was in front of 110 medical doctors in New Orleans at a conference and I spoke for 45 minutes on meat and it's healthy, you know, keto carnivore. And then after that, a vegan spoke for 45 minutes about how meat is bad and fats are good. And then we sat for an hour and we debated each other and we took questions from the audience. So I. I accepted that invitation in the summer. So I just dove, you know, head first into watching a bunch of videos, reading a bunch of research. Cause I want to make sure that I debunked everything the vegan said, cause I spoke first and the vegan spoke second. So I debunked everything that he was going to say. And so I want to make sure that I knew, and you know, I've been studying what vegans say since 2017, cause that's when they found me on YouTube and they started to attack me and they attacked me on Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. So it's like, okay, I I want to know why do they say the things they say? Well, that was 2017, 2018, 2019. So when I accepted this invitation to the beta vegan, I was like, okay, let me jump back into the research and find out, am I missing something? Is there something new that they're saying that I need to know about? And what happened was, I, you know, there, there's not much different in what they're saying. They just have more, you know, ridiculous studies, um, observational studies or whatever. But what I found then too, Especially on TikTok, there's a bunch of medical doctors, cardiologists. There's, you got that guy, Dr. Allo, who actually went to the same high school, which is embarrassing to me. And then there's um, Dr. Terry Simpson. He's a weight loss surgeon who recommends a Mediterranean diet, which you've known as a failure for, you know, 50, 70 years. And whatever, there's these doctors. And they'll say, they'll say that beef in excess will kill you, whereas the vegans will say beef will kill you. You know, so they're looking at the same studies and interpreting them differently. So what, and then there's Dr. Gill on Nutrition Made Simple. He's got a, you know, very scientific channel. I, I watch his, his stuff, but they all say the same thing about seed oils. And they say that seed oils are healthy. They lower LDL and they do not raise inflammation. Now, the fact that they lower LDL and that they raise it, that they do not raise inflammation, those are factors. But, you know, there's that debate between Paul Saladino and Dr. Allo. Did, did you see that debate on YouTube? No. no. So Paul has these, he had about five or six studies showing how seed oil destroy human tissue. And so I dove into PubMed and I found 22 studies that prove that seed oils destroy human tissue. So they lower sperm counts, they mess up hormones, they create pain. 
And if you want these, this list, I can get you the, this list of, of these studies. Yeah, I had on Tucker Goodrich a while ago. He was quite a seed oil, uh, you know, I guess, anti-seed oil guy. I suppose. Right. And he's, he's probably got as much information as anybody out there would on that. So. Right. So, and I love to say, like, well, is there a poison that actually will kill a person but not raise inflammation? And the answer is yes. It's, it's called strychnine. So the point is you can have it and you can ingest something and it doesn't show up on a blood test causing inflammation and it can cause a lot of harm. So I equate, you know, the concept of the strychnine to seed oils. Now, another thing about this is that they've, you know, they've done these big cohort studies where they take, you know, how much seed oils you have in your fat cells and those people live longer. Well, it's just another observational study, but the point is. You know, what if the seed oils aren't killing you sooner, but they're causing a lot of suffering, you know, but they definitely, they oxidize LDL. So, you know, they're probably causing heart disease. They're probably causing platting, but it's in PubMed. But the point is PubMed is deceptive. These, these scientific quote unquote, these RCTs, they only measure LDL. They only measure inflammation. But what about, what about if you other, measure other things about human health and longevity and stuff? So my point is that I got 22 studies that prove that seed oils destroy human tissue, even though they're the, these, these big RCTs that show that it's quote unquote healthy. Well, I mean, when you're measuring biomarkers, biomarkers are, are just that. They're not going to block up. So they, you know, like I said, when they're on the up or down, may mean something. It may not say maybe for, I mean, exercise causes inflammation. Eating causes inflammation in the short term, and it's not, I mean, inflammation is a normal part of the body process. If we did not have inflammation, an inflammatory response, we would get, we would be harmed by that. I mean, it's not the inflammation itself necessarily that's the problem. It's the inciting reason for that, perhaps. And so, yes. um, uh, yeah, so I mean, it's all, it's all in context and it's, you know, like I said, I think it's better to, to measure long-term clinical outcomes, which are hard to do. I mean, to, admittedly, it takes a long time to get the data. Uh, I, I mean, one thing you can say about seed oils is they are in all processed foods or, or all processed foods, many processed foods tend to have them. And uh, so that's another confounder. I, I just don't, I don't eat processed, I don't eat ultra processed garbage at all. So, I, so by, just by that, I don't consume any right. seed oil. I mean, I'm seeding meat, so it's yeah. that, so, or, or, or you mean none, so. There's that, there's that confident, the, the low carb, it's one of the low carbs, like Denver or down under or something. Then you had Chris Kenobi talking about this group in New Zealand, this native tribe, they're eating 94% sweet potatoes and you have the Esco 100% animals. They both have low, you know, chronic illness. The thing is they don't have, you know, processed food. So, but the diet fits trial by Christopher Gardner. His, that trial shows that when people go low fat, so they're 10% of the calories from fat versus the low carbs or 10 grams of carbs or less, you know, you, you, you know, you put them on the wild, if you will. And Gardner said, if you're uncomfortable and eat some fat or eat some carbs, or if you want, if you're at a party, you're socializing, go ahead and eat some fat or eat some carbs. And so he was allowing people to cheat. And what happened was that people did low fat. Their sugar and the refined flour intake skyrocketed like four X from their baseline, whereas the low carb has only went up a little bit. So in this culture, the low carb meal plan is so much better because it keeps you satisfied. You're not craving junk food. So that's our culture though, you know, like that's how it works in this country. So it's like 70% of our grocery store is junk food and 57% or a diet is junk food. So the way you stay out junk food is by eating the low carb diet, meat based. Gar Christopher Gardner's study proves that he'll never admit it. He'll never say it. He says, eat beans and lentils. But all the podcasts that he does, all the videos he's in, he will never admit that his own trial proves that meat is the best food for humans in this culture. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, from a satiety standpoint, I mean, that's what I see every day observationally. And I think, you know, we know that meat, for instance, I mean, there's studies on beef isolate that show it significantly stimulates you know, the long ones is the whole, you know, rationale behind these weight loss drugs. But I mean, their, their response is just to shove more indigestible fiber into the digestive tract to sort of take up space and 
to perhaps, you know, stimulate the cannula receptors so that satiety is occurring. It's, you're not absorbing it. It's not nutrition. It's just, you could just right. assume, you could just assume shred up cardboard boxes and eat those and get the same, same results as you would, you know, as leafy greens in my, in my view. I mean, it's just, it's just, yeah, we shove all this indigestible stuff in your gut. And you talk to anybody who's had a, col had a colectomy who has an ileostomate, and they will tell you unequivocally, all the fruits and vegetables I eat literally end up undigested in my ostomy bag. All of them. In, in, in exactly the same way they went in. You know, if I, if, I, if I cut up a little piece of vegetable into a triangle, it ends in my bag in a triangle. You know, and it's, it's just so they can see that. And then, you know, you get a little bit of fermentation that happens in the, in the, in the lower intestine and in the gut. But I mean, appreciably... You know, based on anatomic studies, I mean, humans only have a capacity of about four to ten percent of our caloric needs can be met through, you know, short chain fatty acids liberated from fibrous um, fermentation, which is not enough. I mean, you know, four percent of your calories is that's going to kind of barely do anything for you. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a good strategy for uh, weight loss in, in the way that you know, if you just shove, so because you, you look at fruitarians, I mean, all they do is eat fruit and a little bit. I guess they eat little vegetables at the end of the day. And they're skinny as all be, but I mean they're 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 emaciated looking. So not, yeah, in my view, good way. Ben. So so let's talk about the next subject. So in the fall, um, researching into uh, pr preparation for this debate with the vegan, of course they jumped into LDL. Who was a vegan, and, by the way? If, if you don't know, um, Dr. Sure. Russell Mars. He's a national. I thought it was this. Uh, well, well, maybe I've heard the name. Well, anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Anyway, so. And so. I found some studies that show LDL is being part of the immune system and LDL is called an obstinin and the word obstinin means preparing a meal for one. So LDL prepares um, pathogens to be consumed by macrophages. So that makes all the sense in the world. And I got the patient who, um, she, long story short, she was having seizures and they were like super severe, like she had blackout. And she, one night, one morning she woke up. Her shoulder was broken in five different places, and she didn't know she was having these seizures. But um, so she saw my video in the fall that I made talking about how LDL goes up because of a, an infection, and that's one thing her doctor kept telling her was it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Your LDL is so high. Why is it so high? And she saw my video. She said, "Oh, I must have an infection." So she told me about this, and I said, "Well, where would you might have an infection?" Usually, I said, usually they're like maybe a parasite in the gut. We're in it like a cavitation, like an infection in the jawbone. It's in the mouth. So she gets a cone beam and she, and it shows a really big cavity. And so she goes to the doctor. And in the meantime, I, I said to her, go get a water pick, put in some water, hydrogen peroxide, salt, and baking soda, and use the water pick with that mixture. So two weeks later, she goes to the dentist. They can't find it. It's gone. She goes to another dentist, gets another scan, they can't find it anymore. All of her seizures went away. And she had word salad, all that's clearing up. So that infection in her, in her, uh, that cavity was causing these horrible seizures. One of the clues was high LDL. And now it's coming down. So, so, this, so this you term, said it was, she had high LDL while she was having seizures. And then it just came down when she, once her infection was all, I guess. Okay. Yeah, it was terribly infection. Yeah, I have, I have other stories like this. He had a guy, it's obviously an infection like in his left temple area going down to behind his left ear, left throat, left chest, left lower torso under his armpit. It's just pain. He's had it for five years and, you know, feverish up and down and, it's obviously like an infection, right? Chronic infection. And so he went on the carnivore diet. That's helped tremendously. It gave him some supplements. His LDL was so high, it didn't even register on the lab test. Over, it was over 3, 350. He didn't go on any sand drugs. He's not going to. And now it's dropped down in the, into the 200s, right? So it's down, I don't know, 100 points or whatever it is. And his acid's resolved. His health is better now than ever before. He can eat a wider variety of foods because he was very limited in his food choice. The pain's diminished too much. He's like, I just saw him in the office. He travels, he's out of state, but I saw him in the office last week. You know, he's like 90, 95% better over, over a number of years. And then the, the, that's the point. I think one of the points of the carnivore diet is that it makes your immune system strong, right? The immune system is tissue. It's connective tissue, collagen, it's white blood cells, it's the vessels, the veins, the lymphatic tissue, the lymph nodes. It's all, it's all protein properties, you know? So when you eat, 
you know, high protein diet, carnivore diet, then your immune system becomes super, super strong. And I, you know, when I figured this out in the fall, I, te- I sent a message to Dave Feldman on Twitter. And I was like, dude, I think one of the aspects of high LDL is for the immune system. Besides, you know, lean as hyper respond responders <clears throat> in the lipid energy model, I was like, I think some people have an infection and all the outs for the immune system. And he goes, yeah, I agree. And then he sent me a link to a video, a lecture he did in the summer. We was talking about, you know, the activities of LDL and uh, transportation of LDL into the um, arteries. Active, it's an active system. It's not passive. People think it leaks into the arteries of the heart or whatever. No, it's not passive. It's an active system. And there's, there's got to be a reason why. Why would LDL go into the arteries? Well, there's got to be an infection there. Now, I saw several videos. My cardiologist in Toledo, his name is Dr. James Roberts. And he's super holistic. He's super awesome. And he said that there's a study, you know, several studies have shown that the macrophages that are stuck in the plating around in the heart, they're, they've identified about 50 organisms, like the skeletons of these organisms in the white blood cells that are stuck in a plaque. So the point is, the more infections you have in your body, the worse outcomes you have for heart disease. So if you had sepsis three months ago, your relative risk for a heart attack is like over six, you know, super high. And if you had really bad pneumonia or bronchitis in the last year, your relative risk is like over three for a heart attack. So if you have, you know, chronic bronchitis, you have, you know, toenail fungus, and you have a rash on your skin and seasonal allergies, and then your ear itches because you have fungus in your ears or whatever, and it could be parasites, virus, bacteria, mold, whatever, all these organisms, the more infections you have, the worse off you are with your heart disease outcomes. And then LDLs and oxygen is part of your immune system. And then I've also seen research where um, even insulin is an immune activator signaling cell for CD8 cells, which is part of your immune system. And if you're not in ketosis, your blood sugar can raise up because of an infection to feed your immune system. And then other things happen. HDL goes down, LDL goes up, LDL could also go down, triglycerides go up. All these factors occur because of infection. So now another interesting point is that when you have abdominal fat, that is so unnatural to have in human history. To have visceral fat, that alone creates inflammation and can be treated as an infection by the body. So I just, I think this whole thing you talk about for the next five or 10 years is that infections cause heart disease. And people say, oh, infections, but they say, oh, it's LDL causing heart disease. No, actually it's an infection. And the LDL goes up in in order to tackle the infection. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty clear that the, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, a couple of points. I mean, obviously, being well nourished is going to improve all your systems, including your immune system. And uh, it's very clear that if this are are unlikable to do have a role, role in the immune response. And so that's one of the reasons. I think one of the reasons when people have you'll often see like a lot of heart attacks or cancers, their LDL will drop precipitously as well. It's maybe it's being utilized in, in a good point in process in some, some some kids as well. But okay, so. Um, interesting. So what else is on your list of things you wanted to discuss? Um, yeah, I want to talk about, um, I got Invisalign a year those and a half are, those ago. Are, those, are, those are dental things, right? Those yeah. That, okay. So if I was a dentist, I'll be being a carnivore, low carb. I've been a dentist twice in 20 years. And I'm like, okay, let, I'll just play the data. I'll get cleaning and see what happens. This is an October year and a half hill. So I go in there and she... They clean my teeth. No problems, right? No cavities, no gum recession, just plaque that you need to get cleaned off. And she goes, your teeth are kind of in at the bottom. And then your upper teeth, that you're not in from them. There's some little marks in your lower teeth that show stress. And she goes, we can fix that with Invisalign. I'm like, okay, great. She goes, it'll take five months. I was like, great, let's do it. So that was a lie, by the way. It doesn't take five months. It takes two years. So she lied to me. So then now we're on this path, right? So six months later, 
Um, I'm in Cancun at a vacation at this resort with fantastic food, right? And I'm, and I can't swallow and I don't know it. I, I'm sorry. I can't swallow. I can't chew. And I, I don't know, but I can't chew because it isn't like straighten it up in my front teeth, but I have these huge gaps in my back teeth and I'm swallowing big chunks of meat whole without knowing it. And my legs get weak. I don't do any fun activities. I don't do the zip line. I don't do, I, I can barely walk. My heart's pounding. It was a total disaster. I, I was clueless. My whole summer sucked. I was unsteady on my feet. It was wild. I'm like, what the hell's wrong? So I got this Garmin watch, a smartwatch in Thanksgiving. And I started looking at my heartbeat. It's got HRV. It's got, um, you know, pulse, of course. Stress level, body battery, sleep quality. And it shows that my heart sucks after I eat a meal. And I realized, oh, it's because I can't chew. So... I'm saying this, and now that I got new trays, it's better, right? I'm, I'm doing much better with all that. And I know you got a lot of healthcare practitioners watching or listening to you. So I'm just bringing this up because maybe your patients can't chew food and they're blaming the meat, right? They're saying like, oh, I can't eat meat. It's hard on my body. I can't digest the meat. Well, maybe it's because they don't have enough teeth. They got dentures. They can't bite well. They can't chew well. They're done. It does like, or maybe it's their gobbler is not working very good. They're not making enough bile. The stomach acid is not strong enough. They got leaky gut, et cetera, et cetera. So just a heads up for people that are coaching others, you know, on health and health improvement. And they're trying to, you know, get their clients to eat more meat, which is awesome. But there might be physical problems with their body that they can't even get there. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, it's kind of interesting, you know, as humans, uh, we're the only species that can survive without our teeth. I mean, you know, we can obviously get replacements and things, but if any animal in the wild loses its teeth, it's done. I mean, it's dead. But, you know, because, you know, so it's kind of interesting that, uh, you know, we didn't survive. You know, if you look at like fossil records, sometimes the only thing they find is a tooth, you know, at least because his teeth are designed to last not only a lifetime, but for thousands, if not tens and hundreds of thousands of years. And yet we have people who are teeth are rotting out of their heads that by the time they're 30 to 40 years of age, because they're eating, you know, a diet that's full of garbage, basically. So it's interesting. That, that, that yeah. diet changed. So I mean, I'm, I'm curious as, I mean, are you saying the Invisalign was a problem for you then? It would mess up your total ability. problem. So, yeah. so you would not recommend them is what I'm saying. Is that, is, is that what I would, enough? I would, if I knew what I was going to go to for the next year and a half with Invisalign, there's no way I would ever do it again because, and even look this up, you know, sometimes people have trouble chewing. I mean, it was a year. And I was telling my dentist, I was like, I can't chew. I suck at the gym. I don't know what's happening. As a matter of fact, my face was falling like this. Like I was, you know, like the tone of my muscles everywhere, but I was losing it. Now I'm getting it back because then I can digest meat better. Did you have bull off the and whistle lines or what happened? Or did you just finish the process? Well, after a year... When the process, when the first stage was done, I'm like, I'm like, okay, we're not done because I can't chew my food. So she re hand my teeth. She goes, no, okay, we have to do this, this. We'll get new trays, you know, in the mail. Once we get the new trays, you can set up an appointment and we'll start them. This one on a vacation for two months. So I suffered for two more months with it. But yeah, and you, gotta, you can't just like say yes to Invisalign. Like it, it can be a disaster. <laughs> and that's my point. Interesting. Yeah, I'm gonna know. I I won't even think about. It. I've got yeah. I get gaps in my teeth. I don't care. But that's what I don't know, worry about it. You know. Well, as long as um, you can chew, that's the whole point. I can chew yeah. good, man. I can I can do some yeah. steaks. And it's kind of funny where, where people will say, "Well, our our mouths are not designed. We're supposed to we're, you know the, the vegans will say our, our mouths go side to side. We're not designed to eat meat." I said, "It worked pretty no, damn good man. for me. I, I pull meat off the bone all the time. And my I my teeth and they work quite right. well to chew meat." So I just started yeah. doing stews. I did more stews. Cause I got yeah. half a cow sitting in my freezer and there's no way I could do burgers. I was okay with steaks. I was pretty okay with steaks, but I ended up doing chili with no vegetables in it and like stew, you know, like that's how I, I had to boil my meat basically in order to, to digest wow. it. Wow. And so, so well, sign me up. don't sign me up for the news <laughs> line there. Nothing I was playing on it, but okay. So, right. um, interesting. So other yeah. topics. Too. I, I, I yeah. Another say. topic is, um, somebody sent me a, a study from 1924, it was done on um, mammals, not on humans. 
what they did is they infected these um, animals with uh, with pet, uh, intestinal protozoa parasites, and then they fed them various uh, foods. 1924, and the, the uh, conclusion was a carnivorous diet is unfavorable for the intestinal protozoa. So I was just saying that, that you know, it's been exactly 100 years, February last month, it was 100 years ago, they did this study on the carnivorous diet. Yeah, I'm not sure. Curious. I don't know what a protozoa normally eats. I can't remember. Which, I mean, I guess it must be some sort of carbohydrate-based fuel, yeah. plant-based fuel, I suppose. But, um, yeah, sure. I mean, we see it with SIBO. I mean, small intestinal protozoa home for a lot of people. Uh, there was a paper in out of Sweden mm -hmm. with uh, Peter Martin. And I, don't remember, I, don't, I think it was pretty printed. I don't think they got to review, but I mean, they did. Uh, they had a case series of uh, SIBO resolve with, with Carnival. So, yeah. So, so this leads me into like um, parasites. So, I use a lot of supplements for parasites. I know you, you talked about, I've heard you talk about this before, but I've had people pooping out parasites weekly since 2007, meaning like my patient, my patient base. Every week I get a new story, pictures, people coming in, like, this is what came out of me. About three weeks ago, I had a woman, she actually put the parasites in uh, paper towels and put them in Ziploc bags and brought them into the office. And she goes, I started to hear supplement and this is what came out of me. She reached into her bag and she started to pull these out. And I'm like, I don't want to see them. Don't keep, keep them in the bag. Don't open them. And she opened them up and she showed me these parasites that came out of her. It was totally disgusting. Were, I mean, were they worms or what? I mean, were they like were worms, yeah. worms? Yeah, yeah. yeah I and saw. you can see you can see the different like they're, if they're segmented as tapeworms, if there's hooks at the end, it's a hook worm, thread worms. And sometimes you give this nebulous stuff like a rope worm, which is not a lie, but it's like just mucus and gook or whatever. All yeah, all I know when I when I was uh, deployed to Afghanistan, we would do a lot of surgery on on locals because a lot of us were were in this different, you know. Yeah, with a lot of just civilian casualties, and we would routinely treat them all with ben with benzol, which is an anti-parasitic. And you would you would literally see um, a lot of worms coming out of them. And I know that um, I know with it, I know the general surgeon when they would they would show intraoperative pictures of intestinal surgery, and they they would just be full of these parasites. Oh, yeah. and their whole entire gut was like lined with thousands of these worms and stuff. So it's yeah. interesting to see that. You see it in some of these uh, developing countries, uh, and you assume that in the United States we don't have quite the number of issues as I mean, is you know, I mean, I guess some would be like particularly no, it's, with it's, and it's, stuff like that, trichinosis, rather, and uh, oh, uh, pork and whatnot. So interesting, yeah. yeah. I bring this up because I've had people do a very low carb meat based diet and they're on the right supplements or whatever for parasites, and then they learn about the carnivore diet and then they go on so beef water salt that's it right honestly within this happened three times now with different patients within a day or two they get out the biggest worm ever you know four feet long or whatever and they feel tremendously better they're like 70 percent better in two days and it's because the carnivore diet did that right it helped the supplement or helped the medication so I, i've been saying this now for a number of years carnivore diet is the best day to get parasites out Interesting. I've never had, I, not that I recall, not that I always look at my boot, but I can never remember my four foot worm going out. I think you remember that. I think a four foot worm came out of your butt. You sort of remember that side of things. So interesting. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I hear there's a lot of people talking about parasites, and I, if I'm like kind of how pervasive it is or how much of a problem it is. I mean, obviously, we, we have a lot of symbiotic things, and some people, you know, there's some people that argue that. I hear people make the argument that these parasites are actually good for us in a way that, that, no, uh, you know, I they're mean, not, this, absolutely they're, not. Yeah. There's this tribe in, um, uh, the Simmets, Simmet out of Bolivia that have a little heart disease and that they're there, but yet they have high CRP and that's because they're infested with parasites. I don't know. It's interesting to, to talk about some of these stuff. Oh yeah. I got a woman, she's, uh, got, uh, ankylosing spondylitis. And it put her in some of for crazy and she started pooping out worms for, her for months and months and months. And she showed me, she's like, oh, look at my CRP. It's 40. And I'm like, oh my God, that's so high. She goes, no, no, you don't understand. It's been over 100 for years. Yeah, parasites out. But the thing about parasites is that they will um, alter your immune system because you got TH2 and TH1, T helper cells 1 and 2. 
And if you have an overwhelming amount of parasites, it'll, it'll like seesaw your immune system favoring TH1 versus TH2 one way or the other. So you can have like seasonal allergies and stuff and you get a parasite and seasonal allergies go away. It doesn't mean that you're better. It just means your immune system has been teeter tired over to tackling parasites. And there's less uh, focus on the other organisms that were causing your, you know, your cinephilic increase, you know, your C9. So you said, you said you supplements for parasites. What would those be? I mean, obviously there's pharmaceuticals that they get blocked. I've mentioned ivermectin, yeah. but then there's also the other drugs, you know, often, yeah. you know, anti helminths and things like that. But what are you, what are you supplementing to, to. Well, okay. So in my it? whole, in my 25 plus career of tackling parasites, I'm going to tell you right now, there's only about, there's less than six products that actually work. And, and the main company that has the best products is called uh, Cellcore Biosciences. And their main uh, flagship product is called Para One, and that's the most Apudica seed. Now, there's other companies that are copycatting that, and they make the most Apudica seed, so whatever. Just And then when you take that product, let's say you open up the capsule, you put it in your mouth, um, the powder turns into like a really soft chewing gum. So it kind of, it's really sticky and it's kind of heavy. So in your gut, you know, grab onto things and pull them out, like physically drag them out of your body. So now you can have somebody who they do that. Let's say they're taking you four pills a day and every day they're getting some weird stuff out. It looks like parasites or maybe just rope, rope worm or whatever. And then after four weeks, it doesn't happen anymore, but they're still on the same dose of the mimosa pretty good seed. So pe some people say, oh, it's just a pill coming out. Well, if that was true, then it would be the same result every single time for the next four months. And then there's other like combinations of herbs. Now there's wormwood and there's clove and there's garlic and oregano. Individually, those don't work well enough. You have to do combinations. And I really think that you got to do liquids as opposed to tailors. And so, you know, there's a variety, but cell core bios, and they don't pay me to say this, but cell core biosciences, they got the best lineup. Um, what else do you want to chat um, yeah, I'll talk about that debate I had with the vegan in front of 110 medical doctors. Okay, cool. Was the, so was I, the, the audience, were they, were they unbiased or was this one way or the other? Or, or how, you know, I'm interested to see how that put together. <laughs> they wanted to hear the truth. Let's just put it that way. Okay. okay. Can they handle so, the truth? Can they handle oh, yeah. The truth? Yeah, yeah. They did a great job. This is actually through the International College of Integrative Medicine. And these guys are fantastic. I've been to several other, other seminars. And, um, the, one of the guys there is a keto cardiologist in, in Texas and he's awesome. And Dr. Simon Yu, he's actually a college, holistic oncologist out of St. Louis. He puts people on like three anti-parasitic medications at once and he's reversing, you know, cancers that way. It's amazing. Just an amazing group of people. So when I spoke, um, I, I debunked everything that the, um, vegan was going to say, and I, and I praised it, um, and then he spoke. But the thing is, after he, his last slides were very anti-human. So he was, um, he played a clip of some doctor saying, humans are a virus to planet Earth. Mm. It's like, well, yeah, that's vegans don't like humans. Veganism is not for the animals because commercial produce farming kills all the animals. And I know this because I grew up on a family farm. We had 750 acres of uh, produce, you know, sweet potatoes, or, uh, potatoes, sweet corn, broccoli, cauliflower, squash, pumpkins. And you got to kill all the animals. You kill the rabbits and the deer and the ground hogs and the moles and the lion. You kill them all. You don't let them live. There's no symbiosis between a farmer and, and wildlife, right? There's, I think people have this idea that farms are natural. And there's like this symbiotic relationship between the farmer and the cows, the you know, the plow, the disc. No, those kill all the, all the, all the small animals. No, the cow, I shouldn't say cows, but cow, regenerative farming is a different story. Because then the birds have a chance, the insects have a chance. But the um, insects and the bird population is down 40% in the last 50, 70 years. Like, it's a total disaster. And I blame the sprays, right? That's a huge, we didn't have any um, fish in the streams. And the, the only turtles that we saw were the big ones that were like 100 years old. You know, there's no new baby turtles because they, they can't survive, you know, the, the sprays. 
So, but the point here is that the vegan said, basically his message was we need less humans. And, um, and there's no you have to volunteer about... first or what? Yeah, that's the point. Now, now during the debate, you know, the moderators were walking around with the microphones and people were asking questions and stuff. And one of the moderators said, you know, there's no winner or loser in this debate because we're all winners because we all get this great information. And everybody's clapping, you know, everybody's happy about that. And then they send that again later in an hour. And about half the audience was doing much this. And then they said it a third time at the end of the hour and nobody laughed. And I was kind of like, I put my hand up like this. Because I won that debate. <laughs> I won it. Now in the recording, now, and everybody, anybody can buy the recording. Go to, it's icimed.com, International College of Integrated Medicine. Dot com so I see I met dot com make an account it's thirty five bucks and he did all the all, all the speakers they had the world's expert on melatonin and he spoke a lot of great speakers but um anyways you can see both talks and you can see the debate if you, if you want to do that who's the world's expert in melatonin out of here oh man I forgot his name you know Australian guy by chance no no he's American he actually started working for NASA studying melatonin in 1966 because they thought about Putting the astronauts in some sort of a deep state of sleep, you know, for extended periods of time. So he's been, I forgot his name, but it, it was actually a great talk. I mean, he was talking about people taking 50 to 300 milligrams of um, melatonin every day. You know, he's been doing it for 25 years, but it's hand like cancer. And only 1% of um, melatonin in the body is made by the pineal gland for sleep. So every single cell uses melatonin. It's a, it's a fantastic uh, seminar. When you, so you said, so, I mean, I guess without, I, I mean, you mentioned the vegan had, what were the vegans major talking points that, that were, that were, and, and everybody needs sure fiber, that. The vegan, yeah, everybody needs fiber. I mean, you talked a lot about the observational studies, but there's a new name for observational studies and it's called human outcome studies. It's the same bullshit. It's the same, you know, can't find the truth. There's no experimental route to help control route. And he talked about all the polyphenols and the plant chemicals, the biochemicals, the astrosanthine, et cetera, et cetera. There's tens of thousands of plant chemicals that you get when you eat all these plants. But I, you know, what just, just, just earlier, just like a week earlier, there's a study showing that when you have a cow that's grass fed, their plant chemicals in the meat is super, super hot. You don't have to eat any plants to get plant chemicals. You eat the, well-fed cow, that's how you get plant chemicals. Right, yeah, that's what took a lot of preparations and, and setting them be done, showing that. But yeah, they have, their, and, and they often are more bioavailable as well. So, I mean, a cow yeah. has a more diverse, a cow has a more diverse access to plant chemicals than humans. So this cows can eat a lot of plants that we can't eat. Yeah, that's um, a good point. A good point. We can't eat grass. Why well, can't we eat grass? Because of silicate content is too high to rip up our guts. So, yeah. So, cows have access to much more wide variety of them. And phytonutrients, which end up in the meat, it's clearly shells. And meat has something like 70,000 individual unique nutritional compounds. And we only just think about protein and fat. And so they literally work a step in that meat. It's quite interesting on that stuff. Yeah. So, so, so also, said, yeah, go ahead. I also want to bring up my favorite part when I gave my talk. I was talking about the mental illness present in the vegan community. And people are sort of laughing. And they're like flapping like this, like, and I was like, I'm bringing this up because in 2017, when they found me on YouTube, they started to attack me. I had to block two to three per week for a year. I blocked over 300 vegans off my channel. And what saved me after a year, you came on to YouTube and then Frankie, that Frankie Tufano, both you guys came on YouTube at the same time and they quit attacking me. They started attacking you. So I thank you for that. But I wanted to, uh. But I also show them the research from Dr. Christopher Palmer and from Dr. George Eads, both psychiatrists at Harvard, and how they're reversing severe mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar, major depression on the ketogenic diet. So I showed that slide in those research, um, in those clinical trials too, as opposed to, you know, you know they're not surveys, right? They're actual clinical trials. So it's like, if you had mentally ill people, 
whether they're teenagers or, or adults, whatever, <clears throat> maybe the prescription is eat as much fatty meat as you possibly can every day. And then there was a few days earlier at, from this um, talk, Christopher Palmer was featured on the Today Show, that morning show, mm -hmm. and he had a patient who, who's, okay, this patient's father was one of the founders and owners of Roblox, which is a very popular internet game for kids. Yeah, so he's got a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, and he yeah. went to, you know, this guy went to see 40 different doctors, tried 20, 20 medications, but he helped him on the ketogenic diet, and now he's doing quite, quite well. So it was nice to have that when I spoke in front of the, all these doctors. So everybody was pretty happy about the the, uh, the the facts that he gave on stage and against the vegan. I think there was about three people that supported the vegan. Everybody else was pretty pretty well um, versed into how the benefits of meat and the importance of eating meat. Yeah, I think a lot of people, I mean, real people, that like you know, actual people like this corporate talking talking heads, uh, don't really much care for the vegan stuff i mean or you know they're, they're, they're maybe they maybe they agree that animals shouldn't be uh, treated badly but in as far as you know going farms going bees i think i think the real danger in my view is not the people are running from bee and i think the real danger is people are gonna eat less meat and i think that's a more subtle message but more perhaps more damaging i think that you know the message should be eat more meat less meat you right and but i think people are you know people are buying into that i mean eat less meat i'm not gonna go vegan but eat less meat and i think that's I think that's more damaging because more likely to happen, you know, it's because you see it already people getting up meat and, you know, I mean, I don't always, I don't always stay in their health in the I think what happens is, you know, if they give up highly processed meats and things like that, you know, because most of us, you know, if you look at, it's interesting when we talk about saturated fat, only of the saturated fat that we consume in the United States, only about 3% of it comes from like unprocessed whole meat, like steaks and things like that. The rest of it is saturated fat in the form of highly processed, you know, meat products like prepackaged meals with all the seasonings and sauces and, uh, uh, but when again, desserts and dairy, you know, dairy desserts and, uh, all kinds of processed foods, you know, cakes and cookies because they have butter and eggs and cream all from mixed in there. So you've got all these, the vast majority of saturated fat is not coming from just only you, like, well, like I would eat, my, my, my diet is you know, or your diet is unusual in the American sort of diet. So it's interesting. Yeah. That's a good point though. It's creep. The creep of less meat. Right. The creep That's of more the more more more, more kind of vegan diet. Meat is a condiment. That to me is a more harmful message than more vegan because no one's gonna be well the I mean, you know, outside of the one or two percent of you know, teenage girls typically they feel bad about animals and they will be for you know, 10 years until, or five years or three months, whatever it is, until they left their health and they said I was stupid. But, but you know, the, the thought that cutting back on me is a good thing is, is probably more on the message, it might be. Yeah. Good point. All right. Got a couple, we got about, uh, I don't know, three, four, five minutes left. Is there anything else you want to close up with or any other other points we missed out on? Yeah. Regarding the um, LVL being for the immune system, you know, being an abstinent, I have about 40 studies that back that up. If you want that, I can give that to you. It's actually in the video that I made, I think it's October in my YouTube channel. I put all of those studies underneath that video. Um, and then I had mentioned about the tooth and stuff causing problems, infections. There's a guy named Dr. Thomas Levy, cardiologist. You know Dr. Thomas Levy? Have you heard I that? He was a regular cardiologist until he learned about how effective Keith could cause placking and the mechanism behind all that so that that is a factor you can have like normal weight i'm sorry you need you can have um high ldl and not have heart disease but you can still have like normal ldl and have heart disease mm -hmm. and what's the missing factor the missing factor is infection and when you plug that into the equation it answers all the problems that people have trying to figure out this this complexity of heart disease you know like regular cardiologists say bring your ldl below 50 if you have active heart disease but but that doesn't make sense because normal um healthy people have ldl or you know total total cholesterol have 180 to 240 that's healthy 180 to 240 but um if you plug this idea that there's an infection there whether it's mold like 
40% of buildings in the United States have water damage. That's mold. That causes heart problems. I had a heart attack on an EKG in 2016, and I had I was in a moldy office for 13 years. Now my troponin was normal, but then my heart pain was horrible down my left arm, left jaw, swollen ankles, high blood pressure, racing pulse, and the EKG showed possible MI. So no LDL, perfect diet, mold caused that. So you can have an ear infection, you can have a tooth infection. It goes down, the, the mucus from the bacteria turns to stone. And part of that stone, you know, that, that's, that's what clacking is. So now I have all this information. I mean, in the last eight years, I've made five courses online and three ebooks about all this information. And I'm just starting to sell this. I've never asked anybody for, you know, to buy something. But now I just started this about two weeks ago. So I got, the, I got an ebook. And it's on my, it's on my website. Yeah, That's I mean, bad. I've seen, you know, I mean, not just infection, but I mean, we see people that have like rheumatoid arthritis or um, lupus or any of the other autoimmune disease where there's underlying inflammatory process that rates for cardiovascular disease go up significantly. Unless you want to argue, unless you want to make the argument that RA is an infection, and then I, I mean, I've seen some people that make that argument that all these autoimmune diseases are actually infections, which, you know, that may not be true, but they actually true, I don't know. I think it is, but when you do the carnivore diet, that alone for a lot of people is enough to get rid of the infection. But then there's other people who need more help. We had a guy once, he switched with um, hydrogen peroxide, food grade hydrogen peroxide in his mouth for several weeks. All of his arthritis went away. So like there's the, these, these weird stories. We had a woman with, um, I guess so many stories like this. We had a woman, she had metastatic endometrial cancer with ascites. And cachexia, she the headbees gave up on her, and um, you know we told her eat raw meat. You got to eat something raw, butter, liver, eggs, meat doesn't matter. She chose a she chose the eggs, so she started eating twelve to eighteen eggs per day, and it reversed her cancer. It's been three years now; all her cancer is gone, you know. And it's like, and and anytime she got rid of a lot of parasites, her LDL was three hundred five. Now it's down to 260 or 240. I think it's 240. So there is, in, every disease is multifactorial. And I think medical doctors are trying to find the one thing that's causing RA or causing cancer or something. There's never one thing. It's always multifactorial. So the basis of any good health plan is low carb meat base. And you get rid of infections, you get rid of toxins. And that's, that's it. Those are the three main things to do. And then there's all kinds of other isolated things to tackle. Darren, we got one minute left. Share where the people can find it. Uh, my website is thenutritionalhealingcenter.com. I got my YouTube channel and I'm on TikTok. Just search my name and find that. All right, man. Appreciate it. Thank you very thanks, much. Scott. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it.